Um, today we have two um, very distinguished speakers. Uh, they'll, they're, they're, if you could, that's, there we are. They are Rubaya Sawa from Innovision Consulting in Dhaka and Saif uh, Mohammed Islam from Care Bangladesh, who's a private sector engagement coordinator for Care. Um, and they're going to be talking about alleviating extreme poverty using a market systems approach and in particular about the work of the Shamoshti program in Bangladesh. So uh, with no further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to you, uh, Rubaiyat. Mike, um, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation to, uh, to be here today. Um, and thanks to the participants as well. It's quite an interesting topic and I believe it can add quite some value in our uh, existing discussions on market systems. So um, without further ado, I would like to um, bring my audience to, to the presentation or the discussion that we are going to have. So, First and foremost, I mean, let's, let's draw some attention on where we are. We know that the market systems um, project, as we know of, they, they have been implemented in agriculture, value chains, fisheries, livestock, value chains, and so on and so forth for quite a while. And increasingly, we, we see that this, I mean, this approach is being adopted for financial inclusion, for skills development, for health systems, even for military control interventions and, and interventions that were typically seen as, as driven by the public sector. So, um, but still, I, what I have seen in my practice as a market systems professional for the last 15 years across the world is that it remains to be predominantly private sector driven approach. Uh, we, we try to drive our interventions through lead firms and they are seen as agents. Now, in this context, uh, we need to see how extreme poverty programs fit in or not, and what we can do. So, in this discussion, what we want to draw attention to is, from my experience of working with not only agricultural projects, but also health systems projects, water sanitation hygiene projects, and financial inclusion projects, and quite a lot uh, with extreme poverty programs that are um, dependent on social safety nets as a key intervention, how I've seen market systems fit in. Um, from that note, there are a few questions that I might like to draw attention to. Um, uh, we often say that x 4 I mean, they do not really participate in value chains as the economic agents, they're not the producers. So how do we really, I mean, reach them uh, if we are following a value chain centric approach? The point is, let's say, what do we do if they're not maize farmers, if they're not fisheries farmers, if they're not handicraft producers? They're so poor that they don't have the resources to engage. Um, and then if we think of private sector as our key partner to scale the interventions, and if the extreme poor, they do not have the resources to get engaged in, can we deliver by only looking into the private sector system? And if not, what we need to do? Um, there are also questions um, related to, for instance, I mean, if we talk about extreme poverty elevation, social safety net, the skills development, health systems, the public sector, the donors, they play a huge role, the NGOs, they play a huge role. So can, can private sector make an impact in that scenario? Can they compete? Can they participate? If not, how do we really sustain and scale the intervention? So, with that context, I would like to draw attention to what I have seen extreme poverty is, and, um, and let's say how I've seen extreme poverty interventions and the market systems interventions. As you will all see in this slide, I've categorized the poor into three um, categories. The extreme poor, the poor who are at risk of fallback, and the poor, I mean, who are not at risk of fallback. So the extreme poor, and if you see, I mean, there are three criteria, resource ownership, income diversity, and vulnerability shock. So the extreme poor, they have very low resource ownership. They're, they do not really have income diversity. As you move up, um, the people who are at risk of fallback, they kind of have some resources. They kind of have some kind of income diversity, but they might fall back if there is an economic shock. They might fall back if there is a natural shock. And then you have the people who have land, who have cattle, who have um, 
the machineries and they're participating um, in the value chain, but they're not really being productive enough as much as to their potential. And they are probably not generating enough income, so their contribution to the value chain or the economy in general has remained suboptimal. So, I mean, which means, I mean, um, they probably are not doing as good as they could, which could in turn have some trickle down effect on the others, with respect to common generation income creation and so on and so forth. So, these people have the resources, they have diversified income sources. Um, but, and, and if you think about vulnerability shocks, as I said, um, the extreme poor, they have high vulnerability shocks where the poor but not at risk of fallback, they have very low vulnerability shocks. So if you, if you think of market systems projects, um, often what we see is that is the, the top one, the green ones that we are targeting, uh, we, we kind of go down to the orange one to certain degree. Um, but we often ask this question that we are being systemic, but to what degree we are being successfully inclusive. And then there are this other end of the spectrum of um, interventions which are driven by social safety nets, for instance, asset transfer, cash transfer, titans, and so on and so forth. So they target the extreme poor households by, by having a very robust targeting strategy. They select them, they give them the resources and training, everything is hands-on. The question is, um, I mean, once you leave them, what happens? I mean, they have started to generate resources, but you haven't really linked them up with the market system. So what happens with them? And that's where I see a collision of the two worlds between extreme cost interventions and market systems interventions. And what I've seen is that one is not really seeing the other. So, and then I started to think about how do we marry the two? And that's when, this very interesting project from Bangladesh that I work for, which is a DP funded project it's called Prime, and I worked for them as a consultant for quite some years, and I figured quite some interesting trends. As you will see, there were two sets of interventions, push and pull, and you can see that there are five different phases through which uh, a gradu I mean, a, 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 an extreme poor household graduate. They typically, I will go to the very details we can discuss if you want in person, but the phases usually are is rehabilitation and then they start to income generate, they, they build assets, they go to an expansion stage and they diversify their income. So it takes no less than eight years for an extreme poor person to, to go through these different phases. And, um, and to start the process, we typically start with social safety nets as a transfer, skills development, microfinance, and so on and so forth. So as you will see and, and you notice that um, there are three different types of poor as we have defined, um, those who are very vulnerable, those who are transient, and those who have graduated. They take different pathways. Um, so I mean, why I'm not going to go to that discussion, but the point is, um, so the push interventions, which push them up through the ladder, I mean, they often are not enough if you don't have the pull interventions which are related to market systems of strengthening, whereby the market forces are pulling them and sustaining them in the graduation pathway. So this is about, let's say, if you are not a cattle, I mean, beef fattening producer or you are not a dairy milk producer and you have started to produce milk as a result of, a, of an asset transfer that, that were given to you, what do you do once you have started to produce the milk? You, you need to sell to the market. So if the livelihood program stops at that level, they're not really sustaining the gain. But if they're also adopting a market-driven approach, then at one point, which is basically the middle point when the producer has come to the expansion stage, you start to connect them to the market. And from the very onset, you need to have that strategic outlook that at one point, we need to pull them up and sustain the gain, which is missing. And once we have managed uh, this push and pull intervention, you get a very systemic um, graduation out of poverty. So it's about let's say marrying these two. And, and, and the point that that we need to, I mean, take note of here is that it's not really um, a, a, an intervention for two or three years or four years. It takes at least eight years or more. And we have. Um, use this um, and, uh, fine games to design a very large program here in Bangladesh, which is about to go into the tender stage, which is for 10 years. And it, 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 it basically is designed with the principle of what you have seen here in this slide. 
Now, um, the learning that we have so far is that, um, as I said, we need to have both push and pull interventions coming together and it intervenes separately. I mean, the push approach, it can be inclusive, but not systemic. The pull approach or our market systems approach, it can be systemic, but not essentially in certain cases inclusive. And um, when we're talking about um, market systems approach, um, if you look back at, at the slide, I, I go back to this slide because there's another interesting point, which is that the push interventions are driven by the government and the NGOs, whereby the pull interventions are driven by the market forces. So when we are talking about extreme poverty programs, our market systems definition and, and the way we draw it, we, we dig deep into it, it also includes the NGOs, it also includes the government agencies, it also includes the donor funding. It also includes all kinds of direct interventions because that, that's the interaction that defines what happens with the extreme poor. So if we are just looking to the private sector, you would really not understand what needs to be done to, to, to help them graduate over the years and to, to, to reach the different interventions. So the final learning that we have is that we need to understand how the government or public systems work, how the NGO interventions work, and how do we collaborate with them to have a more systemic impact. Now, um, we, I mean, what's relevant with social services? When we talk about social services, it's about health, water, sanitation, education, and so on and so forth. So um, we know that, I mean, what we have seen is that, um, I mean, we have had quite a successful intervention on income. But uh, what happened is that we saw that not necessarily that led to people improving their access to education, their sanitation, their water and health services, and so those were not improving. So, so does income really lead to equitable growth with respect to social services? That's the question that we were asking. And then, um, I mean, social services are seen as public goods, but um, the public system often fails. So how do we then bring forward the private system to work together with the public system? And then we have also seen that um, the social service system is extremely um, driven by uh, behavioral norms, culture, religion, um, societal practices. I mean, those are very nuanced practices and these, these are really not, I mean, things that can be changed through one BCC campaign and so on and so forth. So what do we do with that regard? Um, and, and, and if we are not being able to do it, uh, finally, um, the point is, how do we then ensure that these people don't fall back? So, and when I was doing very in-depth analysis of why some people become successful and why some don't, we have seen that, I mean, the, the chronic poor, they often are vulnerable to shocks that come recurrently. And which means that because of the lack of social services, just think about it, if the household health suddenly dies, I mean, the whole family goes into the shock. And if the child is malnourished, the family goes into shock. So all these, uh, I mean, are, are, are then reversing the gains that we might have through a balancing intervention for income agreement. So how do we then uh, successfully intervene on social services? Now, in this slide, what you will see is that what happens when we are marrying between um, income interventions and social space, social interventions. So if you just do income interventions, there are shocks, there are, um, I mean, poor health, there are lean periods. So all of these basically work as a pilferage to your impact. But if you can feel those, then basically the gains are much more robust. So that's when we started to find out the need that we need to marry between social services and income interventions. Now, on that note, um, we organized a workshop this year, April, uh, in, in partnership with CARE Bangladesh, where we invited 16 projects um, from Bangladesh um, on four topics, financial inclusion, women's economic empowerment, um, income increment, and, uh, and, and social services. And, uh, and we tried to find out what their experiences were. And, and here are some key for you that we have found out from the different projects in Bangladesh. Um, so first and foremost, um, on, on the extreme poverty panel, the speakers were saying that um, we really under, need to understand the shifting poverty dynamics. What is important to note here is that um, the poor people, the extreme poor people, they're here now, but they won't be here tomorrow. Uh, we want them to graduate out of poverty, which means it's a declining market, which means the interventions don't necessarily need to sustain for 10, 15 years in the same manner. 
So, so the scalability and sustainability definition needs to be really rethought of when we are thinking of extreme poverty elevation. In Bangladesh, we, in just, uh, I mean, we now have about 12% extreme poor, but um, it was more than 32% just, just 10 years back, which means that we have essentially um, deleted 22% of the population from our market if you're talking about uh, market systems for extreme poor. So these interventions then need to be think in a different, thought in a different way. And like I said before, we need to really think of top-down and bottom-up interventions to merge so that, um, I mean, um, there is a synchronized systemic growth in the whole market system. And what was also interesting is that, as I said, there are two worlds which are not coming together. So we have so many livelihood projects in Bangladesh. So, uh, and the left at the level of, let's say, the people graduating, but they did not connect them to, to, to the market system. So what if the new generation market systems project systematically target those people who were left out and then pull them up so that you have more systemic gain for these extreme poor households? With regards to financial inclusion, the panelists said that there are some innovations, for instance, agent banking and mobile financial services, which are going to the bottom of the pyramid to the extreme poor to a certain degree, but it's still the extreme poor communities are being predominantly served by microfinance institutions. And the reason being that the um, interventions that are delivered through the uh, private sector are not being scaled by the private sector on their own. And, and the critical force that is playing the role here is that, um, uh, I mean, each project, they have a finite timeline. So they're giving the private sector the lifeline for a little time, uh, within which they're reaching out to certain part of the market, but that's not really enough for them to sustain at a scale. I mean, so they're not really getting the economies of scale to, 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 um, to, to, uh, to generate enough revenue so that they can do it on their own. So, so they go from project to project. But also what's not happening here is that the coordination and collaboration between the projects so that the, the, in the five, so that the, I mean, um, these bank institutions, they can leverage on each other's growth and markets. So the system remains MFI dependent. And what happens is that since the MFI does not provide full banking services, the extreme poor for people are not being benefited from full banking services. Now, if you look at the economic environment, um, there were a few very interesting, I, I mean, insights coming out from the field. A, um, I mean, our interventions are primarily on income increment, but what we have seen is that increase in income does not necessarily lead to control in income. And that's because of the social norms, which are not being changed. And also, what we have seen is that the women, they voluntarily opt out not to trade in the market or con have control on their income. And we are del delving deep into it, asking why. What we have found out is that the women are saying, ah, I mean, we are taking care of the household chores. We are also now, I mean, engaged in income generation, but what about the men in the household? So, so I mean, the men, their roles are not being changed in the household. So, but the women's roles are being increased further by our projects and interventions. So there's a risk of increasing the burden on the women without necessarily shifting the gender roles and norms. Which means the gains are not being sustained. Which means I mean they're, they're basically not um, I mean delivering the result as much as we have expected with regards to women's economic empowerment. Now the question is, can we really I mean ask the private sector to change the gender norms and social norms and so on and so forth? So the question again, and the answer that we have found out is that, or the panelists were suggesting, was that it's not really possible. You need the public system, the NGOs, the community system, all to work together to change the social norms, which means the private sector could basically leverage on their work, on, these, on the work of the communities, government and NGOs to do that, but they cannot do it alone. So then again, I mean, we found the need to, to marry the different systems and not to look into the private system only. Now finally, with regards uh, to health education, water sanitation and nutrition services, um, what we see is that the sectors are still dominated by the government and the people expect the services to be provided by the government. But what happens is that the public system not necessarily provides the quality that is needed. But as the poor moves up, they, there is a need for more quality services, there is an appetite for more quality services. 
So how do you reach out to them? That's the key to the intervention success. So what the panelists were suggesting is that the private sector system comes in when we, we basically look into the upper tier where there's a need for more quality services, whereby we need to work with the government and others to ensure that the basic services provided are, are of quality and, and that requires more heavy facilitation, uh, more changing policies, rules and regulations and light touch classification might not necessarily work in this context. Now, um, so those were the learning from the field that we were gathering. Um, you know, Saif will come in to talk about his project, Shomoshti, which is working to, to, to marry the two universes. Um, thank you, Rubaiya. Um, so Shomushti is a four-year market systems development uh, project which integrates uh, traditional market systems approaches with the provision of social services. Um, and I think Rubaiyat set this stage uh, pretty well for uh, me to be able to discuss this. So the primary question we asked ourselves when we designed this project is that is income alone uh, enough to, um, first of all, uh, sort of ensure that the uh, you know, there's sufficient, um, you know, so, sort of there's appropriate targeting of the extreme poor and also um, address the needs of the people who are at risk of falling back into extreme poverty. In other words, will, in other words does income alone uh, necessarily, lead, uh, necessarily lead to the sustainability of economic gains? Um, and whether the uh, access, access to social services can help um, a particular household retain benefits from um, sort of economic development um, through traditional market systems approaches. So therefore, the Shomoshti project, what it does, and I think um, you know we've, we've, we're two years into implementing this uh, project, so it's been uh, a different sort of an experience and learning for us. Uh, um, we've been trying to work uh, with 180,000 households, and within this project, there are two pillars. So one would be your uh, the traditional the market de development, uh, market systems development top-down approach or the whole uh, factor. And the other would be your more community-led, um, community-driven social service um, access or, or the push approach. So um, it's been an interesting journey for us for the next two years. And, uh, in, and I'd just like to talk, walk you through uh, the process that we're trying to follow here for establishing market, access to market services and social services. So what we try and do here is we so we, uh, we sort of built on CARES a decade-long experience in community mobilization, and we we identify communities by um, you know establishing a match between uh, communities and subsectors. So when we select subsectors, we go into communities where the, the, those subsectors uh, have sufficient number of participants, and then what we do is um, we identify and mobilize value chain-based participants. So that value chain, you know on the number of participants, based on the value chain, how many number of participants. We go there and we explain to them our project purpose, and then we engage them in a process whereby um, uh, there is some, uh, there's some measure of, um, there's some measure of uh, uh, you know, sort of well-being analysis that is conducted. What we do is we engage the community and the value chain participants and we try and identify and understand their poverty situation in a participatory manner. We provide them with criteria to tell us you know, what the situation in terms of poverty is. And that ensures the participatory manner of targeting the poor and the extreme poor. Um, within that process, we, or what we try and do in a different way or an innovative way is we identify social change agents as well as local service providers. So local service provider would be somebody who would be, you know, at the, working at the grassroots village level, would be a, maybe a local trader or a service provider. And then eventually with that particular individual, set of individuals, we work with the national private sector and set up a value chain or value chain, um, which, uh, which, which, which is basically the right side of this particular slide. Uh, interestingly, for social services access, we identify these natural leaders, we train them up, and um, we engage, we facilitate uh, a participatory problem analysis session uh, to identify service barriers. So which of the services do the extreme poor lack? Is it health? Is it access to sanitation? Is it access to social safety nets, which could have given them some measure of push 
uh, using which they could have built up assets and then participated in the um, economic or market system? Um, is it um, so some other form of food service value that is uh, very, very necessary to that particular com community? And then in that process, we also help facilitate uh, the, the identification of the problems, the, 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 the the barriers, the reasons for the barriers, and also the opportunities that need that map uh, are mapped out, uh, and also the institutions that are providing those services are also uh, identified. And then we create a link between the social change agents and those uh, service providers, such as the uh, community clinics, such as um, local private sector nutrition uh, sales agents, uh, local uh, sanitary uh, producers. And then we also create the link between them and the national level uh, service providers. So, for instance, when it comes to health, it's not just a local level community clinic that we need to work with. We also try and engage the Department of Health so they in turn facilitate uh, better or improved service provision through uh, local community clinics. And this is all through, done through the social change agents uh, um, who work with communities by helping them develop in community action plans. Uh, to uh, sort of address um, address their social service needs, um, and, the social, and and these community action plans are also in turn vetted with the local government and in line with the local government development process, so that we get sufficient buy-in and support of the local government in creating access to these social services for the poor. Uh, so in our case, we've seen right now that uh, you know significant number of people are expressing satisfaction over access to improved services. Um, there were 3,500 such social service agents creating access to a whole host of services. Uh, about 30 of them have been co-opted with the local government, so they're right now in the decision-making or body or member of the decision-making body of these local government authorities. Um, and some of the some of the key social services that we've been focusing on are water and sanitation and health, because we think that these will have an, ultimately have an effect on on, on persons. Uh, you know, health and, and, and um, hygiene status, which will probably help them prevent uh, incidences of diseases, or also probably help them prevent high uh, high outlays for uh, sort of health expenditure. Um, we try to focus on social safety net as well through the local government in particular, so that the extreme poor and poor can build, build some asset base upon which to uh, capitalize on market development interventions. Um, and I think historically for care, especially in Africa, the village savings and loans associations have worked really well. They've opened about three million poor people there, and and this is an internal group-based savings systems within which people create buffer against shocks, and they also save us enough in a, save up enough to sort of invest in economic development um, of their own. Um, education was once the priority, but our learning is that you know, uh, in, in, in halfway down the line, is that um, investing effort in in some of the other social uh, services probably will bring in more dividends. Uh, finally, what I want to say is that uh, halfway through the project, um, eventually what we want to find out is whether the acquisition or the provision of social services has a bearing of some sort on a person's level of income and well-being going forward, and whether that, uh, whether that income and well-being can sustain enough so that that person can, first of all, safeguard against falling back into poverty, and they can also use that particular uh, sort of capital to reinvest in their business of further growth and development. That data or evidence is yet to come yet. Um, hopefully, in the next couple of years, we'll see more results that are more uh, tangible in that respect. Um, so broadly, one learning that we've had is we need to engage the community and tell them and help them understand that they can demand services from the public sector. Um, it is also very important to link services with income and with being, just as I was saying. Um, so social services need to have an uh, effect, impact on income and well-being, and as they do, we need to gather evidence for that, um, and, and therefore also gather momentum in favor of uh, sort of um, coupling social service access with market system development interventions in a market system development project that looks at alleviating extreme, uh, extreme poverty. Also, finally, through facil for facilitation of services, uh, especially social services that through the public sector, you need to work at both the local level and at the national level. So if you're singularly going to work with the local level community clinics, that may not work because um, you know the movers and shakers at the top are the, the Ministry of Department of Health and Engineering, the uh, Department of Health and Ministry of Health, etc. 
So for different social services, we need to also uh, identify national level actors, just as we do in the market side of the equation. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it. Thank you. Now, does this use of a market systems approach um, and the kind of adapt, in particular, the sort of adaptive management associated with market systems development work, how is that reconciled with the, con the, the, the management setup of the conventional norms of these organizations? And what does it mean for sustainability of the program long term? Okay, uh, thank you. I think uh, I think this is a very interesting question. I mean, uh, so um, the idea is that in a market systems development program, you would not ideally have a situation in which you have um, local NGOs doing the capacity building or local NGOs um, even intervening in some uh, some capacity or, or the other. Um, however, we thought about the fact that. Um, in a four-year project that in, intends to integrate social service access through a community-led approach, at least initially, uh, to set the scene, to uh, mobilize, to, to ensure proper targeting, to conduct proper well-being analysis, to help uh, identify the risks and the vulnerabilities that the poor face, especially the extreme poor, and the factors that um, can potentially, um, you know, uh, shift them back into extreme poverty. Um, Required a significant amount of um, initial um, sort of setting the stage or setting the scene uh, sort of interventions in which we um, engage the community and I, you know, through well being analysis identify problems and identify natural leaders, train them, train them up as social change agents. Um, and then, so these are some of the work that we thought we would, uh, we would, we would have the local NGOs. Um, you know, sort of perform uh, or facilitate, um, and as they are, you know, at the ground and in their best place to do it. Um, however, we were also aware of the fact that eventually, uh, once this the scene has this uh, stage has been set, once the you know value chain participants um, have been mobilized, uh, when it when it is time for them to start interacting with the wider market, um, acquire access to uh, technology inputs and and new services you would improve services, the, eventually the role of the NGOs would subside. And I think that is exactly what is also happening with the Shamushti project. Initially, we started with four local partners. Now, with, um, you know, with midway through, with, with thinking about rebudgeting and, and you know, dropping some of those local NGO partners, when CARE will come in and, and take a more uh, sort of technical facilitation role and let the market uh, sort of uh, interface um, and then so let the wider market interface with the local market and, and, and therefore um, take up the more um, you know, sort of traditional market development approach for it. Thank you, Saif. And uh, Rabias, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think, I mean, what I would say is, um, let's say, I'm, I'm reiterating Saif's point, uh, the NGO's role is here as a service provider. So they're not really, I mean, service provider for the project to administer the project activities out there. So um, how does it then come in? I mean, is there, there um, let's say, uh, more, um, I mean, used to with hands-on service delivery approach? Is this when the NGOs will start to, let's say, also get into the process and start to train the people. So they start to train the farmers and then they drive out some of the service providers. So that's where the challenge is. So I think, I mean, projects that are working with NGOs on market systems, I mean, they really need to sit with the NGOs, train them up, and, and also have them understand what the scope of the project is. Now, in Bangladesh, what is also peculiar is that uh, many of the NGOs are also engaged in um, commercial market system, as in uh, so a lot of the NGOs, they also have the handicraft um, stores, so they train these people, they buy the products from them, they sell the products from them. Um, so that's also something that comes in between. But in that regard, the NGOs are actually part of the market system. So, so that's a, so it's, it's important for the project as well to ensure that they select the right NGOs, which don't have the conflict of interest on the degree of facilitation that is required in the field. Yeah, so ideally, uh, you know, what we've looked at like a couple of years, 
So the last couple of years, we've uh, mobilized right sort of participants and right sort of value chains and identified the right sort of natural leaders and service providers. So now we're, what we're doing is we're looking at the with national private sector and come in uh, so that they can come in and start um, sort of invest co-investing in the project and developing new products and services and technologies for the uh, for the market at the base of the pyramid. And uh, one of the ways we're trying to ensure inclusion is through uh, is by creating um, access for the poor to these services through local service providers. So, for instance, uh, our, uh, national selling um, crabs, uh, crablets. Then we'll have a local service provider pick that up, nurse it further, and then uh, have, you know sort of have have them sell it to um, you know the poor producers, so that they, they they don't need to nurse it for a longer time, so that they're homogeneous and there, there's higher production uh, that they can experience. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, I'm going to try, because we've got a few questions to get to, I'm going to try and link the second question actually to one that's just been posted in the um, chat box. So the question in the chat box, maybe this is just a question of clarification, but the question is from Dick, is, is the whole market approach premature? Isn't the higher priority to address the limited operational capacity of farmers? Um, so they can produce enough surplus to justify a market. Um, in other words, the, the implication of that question is that market systems development is only looking at output markets. Um, the, the, other, the, the other side of the coin is, the, is isn't, it, isn't it the case that extreme poverty is often associated with a lack of market actors with the skills and financial capacity to adopt or adapt innovations independent of, of projects and interventions. So do we have any examples of successful cases of scaled up innovations in this context of extreme poverty? I'll attend to that question and I think I've spoken about it briefly in, in, in my presentation. So yes, indeed, um, I mean, uh, if you look into the market as a, the private sector market only, then you will see that there's a huge lack of market actors. So uh, what I keep on reiterating is that we need to open up our vision or our, our idea about what the market systems consist. So when I talk, I mean, I was giving the example of the prime project of PKSF. So PKSF is a microcredit um, wholesale agency in Bangladesh. It's a semi-government agency, and it's managing a lot of projects um, um, on behalf of IFAD and JFID and so on and so forth. But um, but um, as an agency, it has the um, uh, right to, to, to distribute um, finance to microbusiness institutions who then retail it to the people. So, um, so in the prime project, basically, PKSF was implementing uh, the project, but also they had the mandate to deliver the microfinance. So what they did is uh, they topped up microfinance with skilled services, and they topped it up with asset transfer for the bottom of the pyramid or extreme poor people, so um, how did they manage to do it? They were doing it from, from the interest that was uh, being generated from, from the delivery of MFI, uh, from the microfinance. So what we essentially saw then is that microfinance, which is a market product, the interest of it that is being generated could then be used to provide for some of these um, um, I mean, skills and financial capacity services delivered to the extreme poor. But let's say if we define market systems as that of private sector, and then if we define as they view as something that is outside the market systems, then we will not really see these interventions as systemic and sustainable. Now, the reason I say that is systemic and sustainable is because the MFIs and the NGOs that deliver the product, they are their big fees. Their products are completely market driven. I mean it is not dependent on any external aid anymore. So 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 the NGOs are going to I mean continue delivery of uh, microcredit and with that they're generating revenue and they are capable as we have seen to several econometric analysis that they are capable of delivering um, I mean technical support to the extreme poor to lift them up um, as, as an embedded service to the microfinance. Okay, um, thank you, Rabaith. I hope I hope that helped. Um, I hope that your responses uh, addressed this question. 
um, for participants. It is it is a tricky thing to try and um, explain quickly. I suppose my personal view is that we often underestimate how engaged with markets in, in some form or other um, people living in poverty are, even even people of extreme poverty. Um, now, one of the questions that, that comes up um, both uh, there's, it's been posted here on on the chat box and also on my in advance is about how um, how the, these programs that and, and the Shemoshti in particular how it's designed how it comes how they come into being. So Anne asked a question, a very simple question really, which was about whether the the MSD or MFP donut is a useful tool for for analysis when developing a model for this kind of project. But more generally, it would be useful to know what kind of um, assessment, both market and value chain assessment, but also livelihood assessment tools, methodologies, are recommended by you for promoting this kind of, developing this kind of program, this push-pull approach. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, so, um, A, I really find the market systems donut um, as, a, as a very useful tool uh, to find out who the different market players are. But what is essential to know is that break, uh, to break down the donut into different subsystems. You, I mean, we should not produce a very large generic donut that doesn't really help. So, we need to really look into each of the systems within the overall system and then try to define, I mean, what is the demand and supply side for it and then what kind of support services are, are playing a role to, to lift up and then what kind of rules and regulations work. So, that's one. Um, with regards to livelihood assessment, what we are doing is, um, um, I mean, uh, so, like I said, it's very difficult to explain it all together here, but I will be slow. Um, so what I say is, A, we do a risk analysis um, of the overall, um, of the beneficiaries. So what we try to find out is that what kind of economic shocks, what kind of natural shocks they're exposed to. Uh, we do uh, skills um, and experience analysis of the beneficiaries. So what is basically about what kind of skills the beneficiaries bring in, what kind of resources they bring in. So that informs us about what kind of, let's say, a value chain they could engage in. So then basically we go on to um, analyzing the local market system to find out, okay, what kind of, um, I mean, products and services have the demand for it in the local market context and, and how then the risk and the experience analysis that we have done fit into this. So together this tree then defines, I mean, what kind of um, let's say, income generating activities they could get engaged in. Now, I use the term income generating activities because uh, in context of extreme poor, I mean, it's often very small scale home-based, I mean, income generation that they first getting, uh, and then basically they graduate out of it. But typically, it's part of the overall balance in system. Now, to, to give you an example of it all, so say, for instance, if your analysis show that there is a great pasture land, and then the poor people, I mean, they have cattle, they can graze them naturally. Um, so you, you, you give them a, a cattle, but then also you find out that there, is, there are some private sector actors who are asking for milk. Uh, so you work together with them, but I mean, this private sector are not going to give cattle to the extreme poor. So even if you're giving cattle, and if even if you're, and the skills and et cetera that transfer to the private sector and that start to uh, buy the milk out of the of the household. But also you might see that, I mean, the past, I mean there is not much pasture land and there's a need for some kind of uh, services to come in related to uh, vaccination, AI services, and also producing grass. So, so what we then recommend is that with respect to library development, not engage, do not engage all the produ I mean, people in the, in the producing uh, uh, function or production function. Rather, involve some of them on support services, involve some of them on, on producing some inputs and so on and so forth for which there is a market demand. So that's how you, you have more of a holistic approach to livelihood development. I'd just like to add to that and reiterate the point that, you know, in, in my experience, I've seen that you know, in, in analyzing markets or in traditional market analysis, we we can try, try to tend to focus on um, you know the meso or the, sorry the yeah the meso and the macro level more. Um, I think if you are to address uh, extreme poverty, 
through market assessment development projects to value chain. In value chain assessments and market assessments, I think we need to invest more time and energy on, at the meso level. The simple things like, you, you know, sort of um, beyond, to, to, like Rubayat was saying, are there rules beyond your traditional producer rules? Is there like a product aggregator? Is there a collector? Is there a vaccinator that, that belongs to, to, to the community or is a part of the community and it can really ensure or contribute towards uh, the inclusion factor in, in the, you know, the whole set of, in, in the entire ball game. And also it, it may be useful to, um, you know, sort of adopt um, uh, certain other, um, you know, analysis tools such as well-being analysis or participatory poverty analysis um, or, you know, vulnerability analysis as part of your market systems analysis uh, agenda. So that can give you a very good picture of exactly what, where extreme poverty is at and what risks people face and how can they be potentially overcome and the particular institutions, both public and private, that you need to work with in that respect. That's that's extremely helpful. So I, I was just going to, you've almost answered this question already, but could you just talk a little bit about in particular in, in relation to these tools, what you do around gender? Um, and you, I, you mentioned to me um, when we were preparing for this webinar, something called forced field analysis, for example, or other kinds of, of vulnerability analysis that, that are particularly useful for uh, looking at gendered um, poverty. Um, yes, so uh, I think um, there are many tools to be, that can be used and that have been developed by NGOs for a very long time, but I want to first answer and emphasize that, you know, we need to be very smart about which tool we are going to use when. And uh, there are many gender tools that, uh, you know, come up with different set of outcomes. Um, and some focus on violence against women in particular, uh, some focus on uh, why a particular woman can, or is not able to expand his or her uh, her role in a particular value chain. I think it's important to identify the relevance of which gender tools you're using. Um, one thing that we try and use very simply is um, a force field analysis, which is just basically go into the community and identify women uh, market actors um, and see what forces work for them and what work, work against them. So what could work for them are probably her agency or existing skills levels, such as in handicraft, but probably could not work against them at her level of household burden or the fact that she can't make decisions at home. And these give us uh, um, an indication of where to sort of, uh, if you can weigh in the forces that act, uh, act against her versus for her, then it helps you, uh, it helps you understand where you need to focus your um, investments on um, in, in, in ensuring gender inclusion. Um, so just we try to explain a lot to their husbands uh, through men's engagement that, you know, you need to sort of allow your uh, woman to participate in market systems, share her workload, bird, um, household workload, and also allow her to make some decisions. It doesn't necessarily have to be her alone, but you can make joint, joint decisions to work towards um, was ensuring that your family's well-being is preserved. Um, yeah, that's a very, very basic and simple tool. Um, other tools exist uh, in terms of doing the, in ensuring targeting and, and conducting vulnerability analysis, basically a set of risks that women uh, potentially face and how you can mitigate them. But, you know, tools are there. And I think the, what's important is to understand which ones you want to use and when and what context. Well, just to add to it, with regards to women's economic empowerment, another tool that we're using is about aspirational mapping. So what we try to do is we try to ask women, I mean, if, 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 if they're very young, about, I mean, where they want to be and what's restricting them to be there. And then see, okay, how that can be then connected to, let's say, uh, the market having some demand for certain products or services. So, so what it does is basically, I mean, it, it ensures that the interventions are not, um, I mean, um, aloof of the interest of the women. Uh, it is connected to what they aspire to be eventually. But also on drinks, so what we see often is that the aspiration is completely missing. And um, so when the aspiration is not there, I mean, their, their drive to, to participate uh, is, is also affected. So the aspirational mapping exercise also helps us to understand how do they rate with respect to what they want to do and whether they know about it or they have a vision. And that leads to an intervention on vision building first. 
so that we, we, we try to work with the women and the young, basically the young adolescents to find out uh, how we can develop the aspiration and then based on that we then deliver the intervention. Okay, thank you. That's great. Um, um, can I broaden this out a little bit? We've, we've been talking for the last few minutes about, um, if you like, social norms, in, informal norms and, and uh, pressures that, that operate within the, what in M4P terms or market systems development terms would be the rules area. But if we, can we broaden it out and look more, uh, look at the policy environment more broadly and the, the the question that Yasir raised is you know what what does what does the what can you say about the ability of government to provide desired social services um, if you're relying on social change agents to to provide more voice uh, that's that's great but but isn't there often the case that the government simply hasn't the right policies or the right capacity to respond to the demand for these social services. And so uh, what, do, what do we do then? Very, sorry. I think that's a very good question. Um, uh, and then I think Yasir is very right in saying that uh, if you leave it up to social change agents alone, that will not uh, work. Um, I think um, what, what we try and do is, um, is, is Besides identifying social change as an agents developing community action plans, we also try to ensure that uh, this particular uh, system is also connected to service providers, um, and that there is some measure of alignment between the the goals or the development plans of public service providers and what the action plans themselves are. Like in, for instance, for the local government, which is called the Union Parishad in Bangladesh, um, we have seen that. Uh, you know, they, they, for example, they, they suffer with targeting in terms of delivery of social safety nets. Uh, they don't have the resources, they, they cannot come in, mobilize the community as such, they don't have the tools to do it. What we do in Shamushi is with, through SCAs or the social change agents, we work with the union portion and see where there is an alignment between the development vision that the local government has and the development vision that the community has established. So an SCA can basically help um, the union portion of concerned member to identify tools and utilize tools and jointly ensure proper targeting of social safety nets so that the right person in the community gets access to the right sort of social safety net. Um, that is one example and there could be several other um, of these. Okay, well thank you. Um, now we, we, we are almost out of time and before I give the final word to the speakers, I, I just wanted to flag up again the, uh, the webinar sort of evaluation survey, let us know what you think. The fact that if you're interested in providing, in running a webinar like this for your own organization, please contact us to, to propose a topic. Um, and finally, that on the BEAM website, you will find uh, the address shown on the slide here all recordings of all the webinars that we have produced over the last three years. Um, the recording for this webinar will be available within uh, probably 48 hours at most. Um, so if you want to share it with any of your colleagues who weren't able to join us today, please let them know the link. But otherwise, I, can I just say my huge thanks to, uh, to Saif and Rubaiyat for a very interesting and rich uh, webinar today. Is there anything um, else that you would like to say uh, before we close the event to the audience here. Yeah, thank you um, Mike and also Isabel on the background for helping us organize this webinar. Uh, thanks to the participants. Um, um, this, is, this is quite a vast topic and I, I'm, I'm not sure how far we have been able to capture but if uh, any of the participants, you have any questions or further questions or you want to get engaged with us about how we're doing what we're doing, um, please do write, write to us um, and um, we'll be delighted to, to provide you further information. And thank you, Mrs. Saif, and thank you for listening uh, to us. Um, I'd just like to sort of end by reiterating the fact that, you know, um, so coupling uh, social services in traditional practice system development project is easier said than done, but we uh, sort of tend to think that there is, an, and believe that there is possibly a need for this going forward, and especially in terms of addressing the needs of the extreme poor and those at risk of falling back, back into extreme poverty, and, and the fact that uh, you will have spent a good hour listening to us is also very encouraging, 
And if there is any way you would like to sort of uh, help us or, or you know sort of work with us or uh, partner in any way, then please do feel free to reach out in any capacity. Thank you. That's great. And of course, um, email the email addresses for the speakers will be available on the webinar page uh, that I just referred to if you want to contact them directly. All right, everybody, many thanks for joining us. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and um, I, I hope you'll give us your feedback in the webinar form, in the survey form, and um, do join us for the next webinar uh, in probably in about three or four weeks. Thank you. <laughs>